The Critics of Marxism by Ludwig von Mises This article is excerpted from Theory and History and narrated by John Pruden. The materialism of Marx and Engels differs radically from the ideas of classical materialism. It depicts human thoughts, choices, and actions as determined by the material productive forces, tools, and machines. Marx and Engels failed to see that tools and machines are themselves products of the operation of the human mind. Even if their sophisticated attempts to describe all spiritual and intellectual phenomena, which they call superstructural, as produced by the material productive forces had been successful, they would only have traced these phenomena back to something which itself is a spiritual and intellectual phenomenon. Their reasoning moves in a circle. Their alleged materialism is in fact no materialism at all. It provides merely a verbal solution to the problems involved. Occasionally, even Marx and Engels were aware of the fundamental inadequacy of their doctrine. When Engels, at the grave of Marx, summed up what he considered to be the quintessence of his friend's achievements, he did not mention the material productive forces at all. Said Engels, As Darwin discovered the law of evolution of organic nature, Marx discovered the law of mankind's historical evolution. That is the simple fact, hitherto hidden beneath ideological overgrowths, that men must first of all eat, drink, have shelter, and clothing before they can pursue politics, science, art, religion, and the like. That consequently, the production of the immediately required foodstuffs and therewith the stage of economic evolution attained by a people or an epoch, constitute the foundation of which the governmental institutions, the ideas about right and wrong, art, and even the religious ideas of men have been developed and by means of which they must be explained, not as hitherto had been done the other way round. Certainly no man was more competent than Engels to provide an authoritative interpretation of dialectic materialism, but if Engels was right in this obituary, then the whole of Marxian materialism fades away. It is reduced to a truism known to everybody from time immemorial and never contested by anybody. It says no more than the worn-out aphorism primum vivere de inde philosophari. As an heuristic trick, Engels' interpretation turned out very well. As soon as somebody begins to unmask the absurdities and contradictions of dialectical materialism, the Marxians retort, Do you deny that men must first of all eat? Do you deny that men are interested in improving the material conditions of their existence? Since nobody wants to contest these truisms, they conclude that all the teachings of Marxian materialism are unassailable. And hosts of pseudo-philosophers fail to see through this non-sequitur. The main target of Marx's rancorous attacks was the Prussian state of the Hohenzollern dynasty. He hated this regime not because it was opposed to socialism, but precisely because it was inclined to accept socialism. While his rival, LaSalle, toyed with the idea of realizing socialism in cooperation with the Prussian government led by Bismarck, Marx's International Workingmen's Association sought to supplant the Hohenzollern. Since in Prussia the Protestant church was subject to the government and was administered by government officials, Marx never tired of vilifying the Christian religion too. Anti-Christianism became all the more a dogma of Marxism in that the countries whose intellectuals first were converted to Marxism were Russia and Italy. In Russia, the church was even more dependent on the government than in Prussia. In the eyes of the Italians of the 19th century, anti-Catholic bias was the mark of all who opposed the restoration of the Pope's secular rule and the disintegration of the newly won national unity. The Christian churches and sects did not fight socialism. Step by step they accepted its essential political and social ideas. Today they are, with but few exceptions, outspoken in rejecting capitalism and advocating either socialism or interventionist policies which must inevitably result in the establishment of socialism. But of course, no Christian church can ever acquiesce in a brand of socialism which is hostile to Christianity and aims at its suppression. The churches are implacably opposed to the anti-Christian aspects of Marxism. They try to distinguish between their own program of social reform and the Marxian program. 
the inherent viciousness of Marxism they considered to be its materialism and atheism. However, in fighting Marxian materialism, the apologists of religion have entirely missed the point. Many of them look upon materialism as an ethical doctrine teaching that men ought only to survive after satisfaction of the needs of their bodies and after a life of pleasure and revelry, and ought not to bother about anything else. What they advance against this ethical materialism has no reference to the Marxian doctrine and no bearing on the issue in dispute. No more sensible are the objections raised to Marxian materialism by those who pick out definite historical events, such as the rise of the Christian creed, the Crusades, the religious wars, and triumphantly asserts that no materialist interpretation of them could be provided. Every change in conditions affects the structure of demand and supply of various material things, and thereby the short-run interests of some groups of people. It is therefore possible to show that there were some groups who profited in the short run and others who were prejudiced in the short run. Hence, the advocates of Marxism are always in a position to point out that class interests were involved and thus to annul the objections raised. Of course, this method of demonstrating the correctness of the materialist interpretation of history is entirely wrong. The question is not whether group interests were affected, they are necessarily always affected, at least in the short run. The question is whether the striving after lucre of the groups concerned was the cause of the event under discussion. For instance, were the short-run interests of the munitions industry instrumental in bringing about the bellicosity and the wars of our age? In dealing with such problems, the Marxians never mention that where there are interests pro, there are necessarily also interests con they would have to explain why the latter did not prevail over the former. But the idealist critics of Marxism were too dull to expose any of the fallacies of dialectical materialism. They did not even notice that the Marxians resorted to their class interest interpretation only in dealing with phenomena which were generally condemned as bad, never in dealing with phenomena of which all people approve. If one ascribes warring to the machinations of munitions capital, and alcoholism to machinations of the liquor trade, it would be consistent to ascribe cleanliness to the designs of the soap manufacturers and the flowering of literature and education to the maneuvering of the publishing and printing industries. But neither the Marxians nor the critics ever thought of it. The outstanding fact in all this is that the Marxian doctrine of historical change has never received any judicious critique. It could triumph because its adversaries never disclosed its fallacies and inherent contradictions. How entirely people have misunderstood Marxian materialism is shown in the common practice of lumping together Marxism and Freud's psychoanalysis. Actually, no sharper contrast can be thought of than that between these two doctrines. Materialism aims at reducing mental phenomena to material causes. Psychoanalysis, on the contrary, deals with mental phenomena as with an autonomous field. While traditional psychiatry and neurology tried to explain all pathological conditions with which they were concerned as caused by definite pathological conditions of some bodily organs, psychoanalysis succeeded in demonstrating that the abnormal states of the body are sometimes produced by mental factors. This discovery was the achievement of Charcot and of Josef Breuer, and it was the great exploit of Sigmund Freud to build upon this foundation a comprehensive systematic discipline. Psychoanalysis is the opposite of all brands of materialism. If we look upon it not as a branch of pure knowledge, but as a method of healing the sick, we would have to call it a thymological branch of medicine. Freud was a modest man. He did not make extravagant pretensions regarding the importance of his contributions. He was very cautious in touching upon problems of philosophy and branches of knowledge to the development of which he himself had not contributed. He did not venture to attack any of the metaphysical propositions of materialism. He even went so far as to admit that one day science may succeed in providing a purely physiological explanation of the phenomena psychoanalysis deals with. Only so long as this does not happen, psychoanalysis appeared to him scientifically sound and practically indispensable. He was no less cautious in criticizing Marxian materialism. 
He freely confessed his incompetence in this field. But all this does not alter the fact that the psychoanalytical approach is essentially and substantially incompatible with the epistemology of materialism. Psychoanalysis stresses the role that the libido, the sexual impulse, plays in human life. This role had been neglected before by psychology as well as by all other branches of knowledge. Psychoanalysis also explains the reasons for this neglect, but it by no means asserts that sex is the only human urge seeking satisfaction and that all psychic phenomena are induced by it. Its preoccupation with sexual impulses arose from the fact that it started as a therapeutical method and that most of the pathological conditions it had to deal with are caused by the repression of sexual urges. The reason some authors linked psychoanalysis and Marxism was that both were considered to be at variance with theological ideas. However, with the passing of time, theological schools and groups of various denominations are adopting a different evaluation of the teachings of Freud. They are not merely dropping their radical opposition, as they have already done before with regard to modern astronomical and geological achievements and the theories of phylogenetic change in the structure of organisms. They are trying to integrate psychoanalysis into the system and practice of pastoral theology. They view the study of psychoanalysis as an important part of the training for the ministry. Of course, few theologians would be prepared to endorse the interpretation of an eminent Catholic historian of medicine, Professor Petro L. Entralgo, according to which Freud has brought to full development some of the possibilities offered by Christianity. As conditions are today, many defenders of the authority of the Church are guideless and bewildered in their attitude toward philosophical and scientific problems. They condemn what they could or even should endorse. In fighting spurious doctrines, they resort to untenable objections which, in the minds of those who can discern the fallaciousness of the objections, rather strengthen the tendency to believe that the attacked doctrines are sound. Being unable to discover the real flaw in false doctrines, these apologists for religion may finally end by approving them. This explains the curious fact that there are nowadays tendencies in Christian writings to adopt Marxian dialectical materialism. Thus, a Presbyterian theologian, Professor Alexander Miller, believes that Christianity can reckon with the truth in historical materialism and with the fact of class struggle. He not only suggests, as many eminent leaders of various Christian denominations have done before him, that the Church should adopt the essential principles of Marxian politics. He thinks the Church ought to accept Marxism as the essence of a scientific sociology. How odd to reconcile with the Nicene Creed a doctrine teaching that religious ideas are the superstructure of the material productive forces. The Ludwig von Mises Institute hopes you have enjoyed this audio, Mises Daily. For a world of free market literature, media, and discussion, visit Mises.org.